It's really an honor to see familiar faces and uh, welcome back. And those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. Thank you for making the time to join and participate in this learning community conversation. If you haven't done so yet, please do type, there's Tara, hey Tara, um, please type your full name into the chat and uh, where you're from, because we wanna make sure that we have a timestamp of when you're here. So we'll just ask everybody to do that. And we'll give it just a couple of more moments and then we will officially get started. This particular learning community conversation is approximately three hours today. So again, we, we have a fairly packed agenda, but hopefully we'll get to cover everything that we have on the agenda for today. Excellent. So we'll give it just one more moment. And then we will go ahead and get started. And for those of you who've already done so, thank you so much for typing your names into the chat and where you're from, greatly appreciated. For those of you who've joined us, thanks Juan. For those of you who have just joined us, please make sure to follow Lizzie's excellent example. Type your full name and where you're from in the chat. And then that way we can make sure that we have a record of that you are here and that you will be receiving three hours of credit for your presence and participation today. All right, so we'll give it just one more moment. I will also add, if you happen to be sharing your computer, now I can see Patricia. I don't think Patricia is sharing her computer with anybody, but if you are, please do make sure that their full names are typed into the chat as well, because we wanna make sure if they're sharing their computer with you and they're participating in the training, that they also get credit, even though they may be off screen. Um, so, excellent. Excellent. All right, so folks, Again, I want to make sure that we get to cover everything that we have on the agenda for today. Um, I, again, want to say thank you to everybody who's here for making the time to join us and to participate in this learning community conversation about group work and using groups as a method of engaging and providing care. Uh, for those of you who are here in the learning community with me, again, again, welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. And for those of you who I'm meeting for the first time, welcome. My name is Paul Warren. I am currently a research project director at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. I'm also a senior staff trainer and curriculum writer for the Northeast and Caribbean Addiction Technology Transfer Center. And as much as um, Forrest knows this already, I'm gonna repeat it, which is that that does mean that there have been times when I've been forced to go to Puerto Rico, St. Thomas and St. Croix to deliver training. I've gone when I was forced. I haven't been forced in a really long time. So don't be too jealous. Very, very happy to have the opportunity to be here with all of you. I like that smile, Patricia. She's like, yeah, forced. Mm -hmm. Please force me to go there too. Yes, hopefully soon, hopefully soon. Oh, and Brenda's calling me to show off. All right, all right, okay, all right. Well, Brenda, I've got nothing to show off. It's been years. <laughs> so <laughs> I actually live there, so I know what it feels like to be there. It's pretty wonderful, right? Uh, yeah, I live there for... Um... You know, I still go back to see my family. It's really All right. Well, you, you've got one up on me because I have no family. <laughs> I'll take there. you the next time I'm going. I'll let you know. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll do, we'll do a training together. <laughs> Fantastic. So <laughs> thanks, Brenda. So Brenda's got a lot of books to read in her library there. <laughs> um, so, so folks, uh, I'm also very fortunate to be a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, Mint, and I'm very happy to report to all of you that uh, near the end of this month, 
Um, although it's not Puerto Rico, St. Thomas, or St. Croix, I am going to have the opportunity to go to New Zealand um, because I was actually, believe it or not, Laura, I was actually invited to deliver a workshop there um, specifically about motivational interviewing and training motivational interviewing. And uh, what the reason I mentioned that, um, not that I'm showing off, Brenda, but the reason that I mentioned that is <laughs> that I've also had the opportunity to work with two colleagues, Dr. Kate Speck and Amy Shanahan, on a course that's about using motivational interviewing in groups. So if you're interested in motivational interviewing and you're interested in group work, Keep your eyes open because that's a course that also may be available sometime in the future. Wow. Yeah. Tough. Yeah. So just keep that, just keep that in mind, folks, that you know, we can use other evidence-based practices within the frame of a group setting. So final bit of introduction, um, because again, we have limited time. Oh, do I need a support volunteer? Supportive volunteer always. One always needs a supportive volunteer, especially when going to St. Thomas, Puerto Rico, or St. Croix. Absolutely, or join even the line. join even, the line. Ab absolutely, Brenda <laughs> says join the line. Um, <laughs> and Tracy says, "How do I get in the line?" A excellent. So, so folks, the other thing that I'll tell you just briefly is I am a social worker by training, and I began my social service career providing direct services to people living with HIV and AIDS. And I actually started that work in 1991 and did that for a little over 12 years to 2003, when I made the transition into specifically supporting workforce development, curriculum development, and technical assistance. I'm a graduate of Hunter College School of Social Work. I'm a social worker by training. And my area of emphasis was group development and facilitation. That was back in the days when social work training actually had specific tracks like group work, administration, or case management. Nowadays, it's kind of more generalist practice. I had the opportunity to study under three very influential group workers, Dr. Roselle Curlin, Dr. Robert Salmon, and Dr. George Getzel. And Dr. Getzel was actually my mentor in my work uh, in group work. So I'm so thrilled. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Another, another graduate of Hunter College alumni. Yay, go Hunter. Um, now it's called the Silberman School of Social Work, uh, I believe, at Hunter College. Very, very happy to have the opportunity to be meeting and talking in the learning community with 77 people who are interested in group work. I'm very thrilled to have this particular opportunity. So let's take care of a couple of logistics and then we'll dive right into the material. I will repeat, I did ask, um, and, and some of you may have missed it, but I'll repeat it. If you haven't had a chance to get something to take some quick notes with or uh, answer a couple of questions, I'm going to ask everybody to be able to write down their answers to a couple of questions, okay? Just so that you'll have a little scratch paper to answer these questions and something to write with. I'm going to share my screen and we'll jump into just taking care of some logistics. And please use the chat at this particular moment to confirm that you can actually see the slide full screen and if you can uh if you can see me and the slide i can't see you when the slide is up but i think you can see me so there are 78 of us in the learning community now hopefully i'm going to hear 78 um, people are going to type in 78 y's that they can see me not w-h-y but the letter y that you 30 we have so far, excellent. All right, great. And people are even typing the whole word out, fantastic. So group facilitation skills for alcohol and other substance use counselors. Now, believe it or not, I'm just showing you the first slide, but I'm gonna take it down for a minute because I wanna make a point here. And I want you to see my face fully um, when I make this point. And I wanna be able to see you, which is that the title of this course is group facilitation skills. And I want to throw out, because we're not going to have a whole lot of time to talk about this in this particular context, 
a new course is coming that's going to be devoted specifically to this, but it's not available yet. I want to add for your consideration, when you think about group facilitation skills, that developing groups is part of a group facilitation skill. The ability to be able to identify a particular need and then to build a group structure. And this is long before you ever have met or interviewed any of the people that may be participating in this group. So just keeping in mind, folks, that group development, the creation of a group, the design of a group, the structure, the duration, the educational components, or the programming of the group are all are also specifically skills that the group worker needs to have, in addition to facilitation. And we are going to talk a little bit about group purpose as we go forward, but I just wanted to emphasize that particular point and to let you know that I am in the process of developing another course that will kind of be a companion to this. It'll be a separate course, but it'll be a companion to this about the development of groups. So if that's something that you're interested in, keep your eye. Maybe Laura will be there. I don't know. Um, but keep your, Laura, it'll be you and I, <laughs> just the two of us. <laughs> but uh, But just keep your eyes peeled and um if that's if that's something that you're interested in please consider joining that course uh in the future i'm going to share my screen again and just return to those logistics so again we're going to be focusing today on group facilitation skills for alcohol and other substance use counselors now although there is a subtitle to this these skills these practices, these interventions that we're talking about, of course, can be applied in other group contexts, not specifically and exclusively to alcohol and other substance uses. So there is some universality to the application. We're a learning community of now 82 people. And because of that, what we talk about, what you bring to the table, what I share with you, we need to acknowledge that that may not necessarily reflect the official positions of our funder and to consider that that's actually okay because our funder intends these learning community conversations to be relevant and supportive to what you're actually doing as opposed to just kind of spitting out facts and figures and content. So my hope is that we will engage in a learning community conversation that's actually relevant and supportive to what you're actually doing as you consider and facilitate and develop groups. As we engage in this learning community conversation, we want to be using words and language that actually and intentionally put people first. And we want to be using language that is respectful, welcoming, and inclusive of all 82, now 81. Somebody either got kicked out or they, they left because maybe they were in the wrong place. But all 81 of us that are, maybe they'll come back, but all 81 of us that are in the learning community. So language that is welcoming, respectful, inclusive of everybody that's here. PowerPoint now makes it official, welcome, exclamation point. There will be a brief evaluation at the conclusion of our conversation today. Uh, I say this in every learning community conversation I have the privilege to facilitate. I will do my best to try and leave a little bit of time before 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. I will do my best to leave a little bit of time at the end so that you can complete the evaluation and then go on to your next appointment. Sometimes I'm not so effective at that. Uh, and we go right up to the end and then it goes over. I'm gonna do my best to make sure that you have time, but again, I can't guarantee that. 
this will be the last time I'll say it. There, there are now back, there are 82 of us back in the learning community. Uh, and what I will ask is if you have not yet, not a problem, not a problem, Angelina, glad you're here. Um, if you have not yet typed your full name and where you're from in the chat, and if you're sharing your computer with anybody, please type their full names and where they're from in the chat. If you haven't done that, please do that now. Timestamp, you're here. We want to make sure that all 82 of us get credit for our presence and our participation in the learning community conversation today. So a couple of things, additional logistics in addition to welcoming respectful and inclusive language. You may or may not remember this, but when you registered for this learning community conversation, you actually registered and agreed to have a working camera and a microphone and to be able to be on camera for the full duration. Now, a couple of people have already sent me private messages that their cameras are not working or, or for whatever reason. That is perfectly okay. I am just glad you're here. Please participate in through the chat on muting. Again, if you have a camera and you can turn it on, please turn on your camera and be on camera for the full duration of the course. Now, having said that, it's possible that somebody may need to step away for a moment in order to attend to something. I wanna respect that. By all means, turn your camera off, send me a private message and just say, I'm stepping away or I'll be right back, BRB, and go off and do what you need to do. Stepping away is not stepping out. <laughs> stepping out means you're gone for 15, 20, 30, one hour. Please, you're more than welcome to step away if you need to. Zoom is an effective monitor of the distinction between stepping away and stepping out. So please, if you need to step away, go right ahead, just let me know, and then come back and join us and participate. That's all I think I need to say about that. I respect your autonomy to do uh, what you feel is right in order to participate and uh, earn your credit for this learning community conversation. Having said that, um, there are 83 of us in the learning community now, and I understand um, that, uh, you know, it's... It, it, there could be a lot of background noise if we were all unmuted at the same time. So what I'm going to ask, unless you have something that you want to say, contribute, share, react to, if you wouldn't mind remaining muted, that would be great. Now, having said that, if you have something that you want to say, if you have something that you want to contribute, share information, share a perspective, react to what's being said, do not hesitate to unmute. And you're more than welcome to interrupt me. What I would ask, though, is if one of the other 82 of us in the learning community has the floor, other than me, um, has the floor, it, let's say Forrest has the floor, please don't interrupt Forrest in the middle of what Forrest is saying, okay? You are more than welcome to interrupt me mid-sentence if you want to add something, question something, comment, but please don't interrupt anybody else. Please let them finish and then... You can have the floor if there's something you want to add or share a different perspective. I will do my best to manage that for everybody. We are a learning community, and it's perfectly normal for us to not necessarily agree, have the same experience, or share. Uh, ooh, I think I heard somebody unmute. Did somebody want to say something? No? Okay. If you do, just let me know. So... What I would ask is, especially if you hear something that you don't necessarily agree with, please give that person the courtesy of allowing them to share their perspective. If you want to share something else, you're more than welcome to. We're a learning community. The, the goal is not to be in agreement. The goal is to have effective, respectful dialogue between all of us that are here. And then the final guideline that I would ask everybody to consider is to please speak from the I. I believe this, I know this, all of that. So just, just keeping that in mind. Um, and what I will just say about speaking from the I is I will also attempt to do the same. And 
there may be times when I may make a generalization and I will try and preface with I'm about to make a generalization based quote unquote on my experience or what I've read or but I will try and preface it with this is a generalization so other than that though I in addition will do my best to attempt to speak from the eye so let me advance to the next slide. This is the purpose. We're not going to discuss this right now, but let me stop sharing my screen for just a moment. And let me just ask, can everybody agree to those guidelines as stated? You can wave, nod, throw money, make a direct deposit in my checking account. Thank you, Kelly. That's the double thumbs up that almost looks like milking a cow. I like that. Perfect. I love it. I love it. Um, I grew up in a town where there were more cows than there were people. And then I moved to New York City in 1981. <laughs> Big culture shock. But I've been here ever since. So excellent. Wonderful. So those are our guidelines, folks. Greatly appreciated. Thank you for working with me on that. Excellent. All right. So I will go back to sharing my screen for just a moment and underline very specifically the purpose and the learning objectives. Our conversation is really meant to focus. Ah, yes, Susan is mentioning about the PowerPoints. Uh, they will be shared with you, Susan, at the completion of this particular learning community conversation. Once you complete the evaluation and we get your uh, evaluation, we will send you about two weeks later your certificate of three hours of credit and we will also send you a copy of the slides, which you are free to use and share in any way that basically supports your work. And the evaluation, um, Tiffany is asking if the evaluation has been fixed because there's a glitch, it seems, uh, from what Tiffany and many others have reported, that if you choose to not select an ethnicity, you get sort of into this loop that doesn't allow you to complete the evaluation. Still under repair, sorry to say. And thanks for asking up front. So we will focus on the development of groups and we'll focus specifically on the use of groups as a method of intervention. And again, I want to stress that as a group or groups as a method of intervention, just like case management is a method of intervention, just like individual therapy is a method of intervention. Group is also a method of intervention. And to especially distinguish between group work and the phenomena of casework in a group and the skills, the specific skills that are actually necessary to facilitate a group and not to engage in case management in the group. Uh, just checking the chat for just one quick moment because I'm seeing that there are some things coming in. Okay, so um, just make it clear what name you're registered as. Um, that would be very helpful. Okay, and yes, we can make this audio recording, uh, the, the recording of this course available to folks. Um, and uh, what, I, what I do need to stress in regard to that is that uh, if you are not present for the full three hours, we can't issue partial or any credit. So if you're here now and you can only stay for a portion of the learning community conversation, we can certainly make the recording available to you because you're here and you're registered. Unfortunately, we can't issue partial credit. Um, we can only offer credit to those who participate in the full three hours. And that's why we ask you to um, type your full name into the chat. Not a problem, Cassandra. Thanks for letting me know. 
All right. So folks, just a quick touch on the learning objectives. So there are specific, as many of you probably know, and it will be a refresher for many of you, there are specific stages of group development and there are advantages to being aware of that stage model of development. Um, it's not necessarily a linear process. There can be regression, especially near termination or adjournment of a group. Uh, and it can be helpful to have a, an understanding of those stages of development. Also, there is a very clear difference between casework and group work, and oftentimes what uh, happens in groups is actually casework. It's not actually group work, and that's a result, and I'm going to frame it this way, it's a result of the lack of the ability to facilitate and to facilitate a group as opposed to engaging in what I will frame as dyadic conversation, meaning a member of the group talks to the group leader, the group leader talks to the individual member, while the other group members are observing the conversation. And we'll get more into that as we go forward. We're also going to talk specifically about the purpose of establishing and maintaining group guidelines. We'll also talk about the role of the group purpose statement. And you may recall that I mentioned the other course that is in the process of being developed. There will be a lot of focus on the group purpose statement in that course. We're going to touch on it here. In that course, there will be an in-depth focus on that, specifically from the perspective of developing a group. And then the last thing, there is a phrase, the greatest, the greatest artists know when not to play their instruments. And hopefully, time permitting, we will have a conversation at the end of this learning community conversation as to how that particular statement, I'm planting seeds here, how that particular statement actually relates to doing group work, how it actually relates to the facilitation of groups, which are very different than engaging in dyadic conversations. So, here is where that scrap paper will be very helpful. I want to ask a series of questions, which I'm also going to answer along with you because I am a group worker. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to answer these questions and just have the answers handy on a little scrap of paper. I'm going to show you my little scrap of paper uh, that I'm using because I'm recycling, but it has a little face on it. But I'm going to use the other side because I'm recycling this paper. So groups and you. Now, some of these questions, most of these questions are really closed questions because we're just getting specific bits of information. But we're going to have a discussion about some of these questions as we launch into this particular topic. So if you are ready to answer these questions with your writing implement, and your little piece of scratch paper, if you're ready to answer these questions, type the letter Y in the chat. And I'm hoping I'm going to see 77 people type the letter Y in the chat or type the, so far one person is ready. Um, so let's, we'll have to wait for the other 76 to type the letter Y in the chat. Then maybe they're all rushing out to get their scrap piece of paper and their writing implement. So if you're ready to answer these particular questions and write down the answers, thank you, Rose. Um, if you're able to do that, please type the letter Y in the chat. Excellent. Okay, excellent. Thank you, John Paul. Excellent. Excellent, good, good, good. Okay, so people are getting their scrap paper. All right, and again, I'm gonna ask you to actually physically write these answers down because we're gonna to refer to them as we go forward. All right, 
Hopefully everybody's got what they need, your little piece of scrap paper and your writing implement. Question number one, which is actually question A. Experience leading groups. One means zero experience. Five means I'm going to be facilitating a group or have facilitated a group already or sometime this week. So on a scale of one to five, what is your experience in leading groups? So that's question A. Question B, have you ever been in a group? And that's probably a closed question, yes or no. Have you ever been in a group? And write that on your little scratch paper as well. C, are you currently leading a group? Actually, I can answer that question absolutely yes, because I'm actually facilitating a learning community conversation as I speak. So that would be a big yes for me. So are you currently leading a group? Were you D, were you trained to lead groups before you actually started leading groups? I know my answer to that. All right. E, what's the first thing you think of when you think of group work? Okay, and just jot that down. And one want you have from this learning community conversation. What's one thing you want to get out of your participation? And we and we can set the three hour certificate credit aside for a moment. Perhaps the uh, a, an additional thing you'd like to get out of this learning community conversation. And just jot that down. All right, excellent. So what I'm going to ask everybody to do who's here, and again, hopefully you are uh, answering these questions on your little piece of scrap paper. Um, I see that some of you are putting them into the chat as well, which is great. Uh, what I would ask everybody to do in the chat from your list right now that uh, you hopefully uh, made a little bit of uh, notes on is I'm going to ask everybody at this particular moment who's in the learning community to type in the chat your answer to question A, your experience leading groups. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So everybody, I'm getting a lot of range here. Fantastic. Fantastic. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Excellent. So the other thing that I'm going to ask everybody to also type in the chat, and then I'm going to take the screen down for a moment. Wonderful. Thank you for your robust responses there, folks. That's great. So, and we're seeing a very wide range from ones all the way to fives everywhere along the scale. Fantastic. And it's great that we have such a rich blend of experience in this learning community. I'm going to ask everybody to also use the chat, and I will do it as well. I'm going to ask everybody else to use the chat to answer B. What is the answer you put for B? Have you ever been in a group? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. And I'm seeing some no's, but I'm seeing a lot of yeses. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Good. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because I'd like us to engage in a little bit of dialogue about this. And I'm very curious if there's anyone who's who has had the experience, because I'm going to make a personal disclosure here. I started facilitating groups before I was actually trained to do it. And I don't, Angelina, go ahead. Did you want to comment? Go ahead. The same as you. I was not trained to facilitate groups before I did. Okay, could I ask you a quick follow-up question? Sure. So what was that like for you? I felt like a kid lost in the mall. I was like, okay, what did I just get myself into? But I had to do the meeting because it was part of my job. 
So I felt kind of like without the proper training, I kind of winged it. And you never know what you're doing wrong, like how you're setting up a group. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Angelina. And I, and, you know, I can really um, see the imagery that you described. Like I felt like a kid lost in the mall and, and left kind of wondering like what, what was going to happen. Fantastic. Heather, the floor is yours. Go ahead. So I had college classes, but I think academic and real life experience is different. So I would have appreciated maybe co-facilitating before I let all by myself. Okay. Okay. So studied it in school, didn't have the facilitation experience, didn't have the co-facilitation experience of seeing somebody else. Yep. Okay. Great. S Steve, go ahead. The floor is yours. Steve, we can't hear you. Your mouth is moving, but you're muted. There you go. Pardon, pardon me. No problem. Um, Isabel, so I, I work at a school. Not a problem. Um, the train is coming in. <laughs> so uh, I, I went to a lot of AA meetings and LT meetings as a young person um, with my mom, who's been in recovery for over 50 years. And, um, so that's... Oh. That so there was like uh, an influence in terms of the power of groups before I, you know, had any consciousness of it. But as a professional, yeah, I went in without some training in the beginning. But I got very good training about three years in that made a big impact on me, and I use that training all all the time still. Fantastic, Steve. And you know, thank you so much for sharing that because you're also talking about the benefit of participating in a group and how that kind of influenced you even before you got the training because you were put in the position of leading groups. Exactly that. Because I will underline, and, and you, may or, you may or may not agree with this, I will underline, folks, groups are powerful. They can do something and offer something that individual work Individual therapy does not. Go ahead, Nicole. The floor is yours. To just piggyback off that power piece and the last gal that talked, I had the educational training, but the real life experience was lacking. And I actually found myself with a lot of fear that I would cause more harm instead of it being a fruitful and productive environment. Yes. Uh, that was a big learning curve yep, for me. Yep. And Angelina alluded to that as well. The idea of like, what if what if what I'm doing is you know harmful yeah 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 anybody else want to unmute whether you had training before did joshua any any thought any reaction did you yeah any you can pass if you don't want to comment any any thought any reaction um i actually uh have facility i do a uh, refuge recovery group uh, sorry, I'm in a library, so I'm trying not to be too loud. Um, I, I, yeah, I facilitate a refuge recovery group, and I have no training whatsoever. I'm a peer specialist myself, um, so all my training comes from, I guess, experience, and I just kind of, um, it was either somebody take over the group and start facilitating it, or it goes away, so I just started doing it, and it's been, I mean, I guess my experience has worked it's still going on and people seem to like it fantastic thank you so much joshua and again very similar that like your experience has kind of helped you to be able to facilitate it and the group continues and you took it over because it was going to die if you didn't yep. fantastic forest and then adidas and then uh Venar. yeah oh tanya go ahead and then we'll go to forest go ahead tanya Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm out of space right now. Yes, I um, see that. So, just like Doris. <laughs> I'm sorry. So um, the first time I had to facil facilitate a group, yep. uh, I want to say that it was through the internship um, time in my life when I was doing addiction counseling. Yep. So I was able to sit in on a couple of groups first. Okay. But when the floor was handed over, I was sitting there like, you want me to do what? So I think... The first time you do is a little overwhelming because you're like, you want to be received as the facilitator, number one. Yes, yes. You want to feel that you're getting through as a facilitator. You want to under, you want to make sure that, you know, you you have a welcoming presence to everyone in the group. Yeah, yep. 
And then for yourself, you're sitting there like, I hope I'm doing the right thing. I hope I'm saying the right thing. I hope I'm reaching somebody. Yeah. You know, yeah. Especially in the prevention realm of things. So it's it was a bit overwhelming at first, but then I think what helps us as facilitators is that when you start getting feedback. Okay. When you have people stopping you before you leave a room to talk to you and say, I really, I got something out of it. I appreciate okay. what I heard, you know, like something. So then okay. now you begin to feel like, okay, maybe I'm getting somewhere, you know, you know, and then you begin to hear it more often and you're like, yeah. something you said was able to reach somebody. And then I think another, one more thing I'd like to add is as a facilitator, Please. you want to have that open-ended question type of um, environment so that you allow people to feel free to say things that they want to say. Yep. And, and and let them know that it's in a confidential space. It's a, you know, this is a safe space. So I think once they feel safe to speak yes. and other people are talking and they're having yes. similar experiences, they're like, oh, then I could say this too. It's okay to say that. And then of course, sharing a little bit about yourself, not too much, but just a little bit about your own experiences. It might help somebody else. That's it. Got it. Got it. So before we go to Forest and then to Adidas, and then Bernard, and then Emily, let me just underline something that Tanya said. And Tanya, you said a lot that was very, very rich. Yeah, I've been talking too much. I'm sorry. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. So, so two things I want to underline. One, the shift into when you take on the role of facilitator, like, oh my goodness, what do I do now? And the experience of facilitating, helping you to realize, kind of finding your way into the facilitation. So that's one thing. The other thing that Tanya said, and I really, really want to underline this, is that the role of the facilitator above and beyond everything is to set and establish the climate of the group and maintain the safety of the group so the group can do its work. And Tanya, you, you touched on that and, and expressed that so clearly. So, so thank you. Forrest, the floor is yours. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, <laughs> I'm hearing everybody's stories, and unfortunately, mine wasn't like that. My job actually took the time to create what they call a mock. Have you guys, have you ever heard of that? Where we yeah. mock everything, where we, we we try it out first and we see if it works. Are, are you, and we, we practice and practice and practice and practice before we even get to there. Now, my first time facilitating, the group knew that I was fresh meat. They could see it, right? Oh. And <laughs> I got frustrated yeah. at what was going on. And I yelled, I ain't gonna lie. I yelled, I showed my ass. I was going there. But yeah. this was for a healthy relationships um, intervention that we were doing. So it was teaching you how to deal with things that come up in your life. So what I ended up doing was taking something from the facilitation and using it in the facilitation. Um, it was this thing out there called, I feel I need, I want. And so I went in, I feel a little disrespected by the group because mm. this is what's going on. I need for the group to act this way. And I, it, and it really helped. And now I figured out that facilitation is my superpower. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for us. And again, I love the, the, I want to identify, again, there, Forrest said a lot, just like Tanya, but I, I want to underline two very specific things. One, Forrest, you talked about the benefit of safe practice in a mock setting, that that can be really, really helpful. And not everybody gets that kind of experience. So safe practice in a mock setting. The other thing, and you you touched on this, the group can sense our degree of ease or discomfort. The group can sense that. And, and again, it's human if we're learning something new to feel a certain degree of discomfort or if we feel unsure about what we're doing. And the group can sense that. 
So I just wanted to underline the reality of that. So we're going to go to Adidas, Bernard, Emily, and then John Paul. Go ahead. And please tell me if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Adis, are you there? Oh, I think he's frozen. Oh, I think we lost him. Okay, hopefully he'll come back. Bernard, we're going to go to you and then Emily, and then we'll come to John Paul. And if Addis comes back, we'll we'll give him the floor. Go ahead, Bernard. All right. Yeah, I'm uh, pretty much the same thing with the groups. It's not not a whole, not a whole lot of training, you know. But one of the things I did, uh, I did most of mine the past year. Like you, know, I worked with folks with HIV and and AIDS and stuff, and and that was just a whole learning experience. And for me, the group format was, uh, I pretty much did like everybody else. Just more, you know. I, I didn't really have a general idea what what it's supposed to look like and how it goes, you know. So I was I'd always remind the guys, you know, it was their group, whatever you want to talk about. Right. Of course, they'd always look at me and say, "So what are we talking about?" So for me, it was always it was always about uh, I enjoyed asking the questions, opening the questions, and, and we would, you know, it was just a couple questions and and we could discuss the whole discuss, you know. So and you know, we made it it's the same thing. You didn't have to answer if you didn't want to, but mm -hmm. even with the questions that we that I usually put out. Uh, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. A lot of the questions, you know, I told them was like, we didn't talk about HIV. We didn't talk about any of those things because, you know, my, my thought was they live with HIV. They understand HIV. Yeah. So let's talk about, and because it was a men's group, let's talk about men issues as far as dealing with the issues that men. Yeah. And, then, and again, for me, it was easier because, again, I, I was a man. So, you know, we could focus on that. And we spent a lot of time talking about men issues and something came up with, HIV, you know, especially when when you equal you comes up, you know, that, yep, that was yep. a good topic. So we talked about that and it was interesting how a lot of them weren't even sure about you equals you. They didn't quite believe it either when it first came out. But, you know, now that it, it, it's at that point where yeah, it's for real, the science works. But yeah. uh, for me, it's always been about asking questions to make them think and and just process it from that from that point on. So so that's usually how I've done my, my groups. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. And and I want to underline also before we go to Emily, and then I'm I'm really wondering if the real John Paul Sharp will stand up because we have two in the learning community, it seems. Um, but one of them has their hand up. So <laughs> uh, let me let me just uh, interject, if you don't mind, Paul. I'm, I don't... I'm the uh, I, I'm the actual John Paul Sharp. The other John Paul <laughs> Sharp you see there is uh, is from my agency. That would be uh, David Flores. Uh, David, if you'd like to change your profile name there. To David <laughs> Cool, thank, but thank you, John what's Paul. Going on? Thanks. <laughs> thank you so much. And David, very nice to meet you, David. I've tried. I've tried to. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can change it for you, David. Yeah. Hold on, just one second. So, I, before we go to Emily, I just want to underline something, Venard, that you said that I think is a critical thing to keep in mind because Venard gave a great example of. The group facilitator saying to the group, well, it's your group. What do you want to talk about? And the group member saying to Bernard, well, you're the group facilitator. What are we supposed to talk about? And the beauty of that, and thank you so much for sharing that. And, and it sounds very specifically, Bernard, that you really came up with a way to engage this group into what they wanted to talk about. But the question that it really raises that again, I hope we'll all be considering because we're not going to get to dig too deep into this, is what is the purpose of the group? Because when we're facilitating folks, our facilitation is based on the purpose of the group. So just, just keeping that in mind. Emily, thanks so much for your patience. The floor is yours, and then we're going to go to David. Go ahead. Um. Hi, I just wanted to quickly share that I'm actually an intern um, pursuing my MSW and I'm working in a recovery program. So I haven't facilitated any groups yet. Um, I'm on my way to in a week or two co-facilitating for the first time. Okay. Um, so I've been shadowing groups and I just want to say I'm really grateful for this opportunity. My supervisor was the one who provided me the um, with the link for this training. So, you know, I'm excited to pick up some more skills and techniques and I've already heard so many um, great things that I'm taking note of. So I just wanted to share that. You're welcome. And Emily, can I ask you a quick follow-up question? Of course, yeah. So before we go to David, let me let me just ask quickly, 
given that, you know, you're about to embark on this. And I'm so glad that the learning community, all 81 of us are here with you sort of, you know, before you embark on it. If, if you had to sort of say like what your biggest question or your biggest concern was about facilitating groups, what kind of rises to the top for you, especially given that you're in a, a really unique kind of position? Mm -hmm. Um, I'd say that I think um, some other people touched on it on the um, going in for the first time and not knowing for sure if you're going to be received well by the group. I think Boris touched on it on um, them having to um, like go back at the group to basically ask for them to cooperate because like they said, I'm fresh meat. Um, and, you know, my supervisor said that the clients are, are kind of known for um giving a tough time to the new interns and stuff like that. So I'm a little concerned for that, but I feel better after this and the other trainings that I've signed up for of knowing I'll be a little bit more comfortable going in, knowing some more um, skills and techniques to use. So Fantastic. Thank you so much. And, you know, I, I would venture to guess, Emily, that what you're describing is probably something that all group facilitators have a concern with. And again, I will throw out two things to consider that, that help, and I'm going to put it this way, Emily, that help contribute to our confidence in assuming, and Tanya referred to this, in assuming or fulfilling the role as the facilitator. Thing one, knowing the purpose of the group. Thing two, working with the group to establish the group guidelines about how we're going to interact with each other. Those two things can really kind of help set the stage and help build confidence in terms of when we when we step in to facilitate. So I, I'm so glad you're here, Emily, and, and thank you for sharing. And, and I hope that somewhere down the line, we'll get to check in with you again about like, how it's going and hopefully um the lions quote unquote won't be hungry uh so you will you will have charmed them when you go ahead emily go ahead i hope so thank you i appreciate that and yeah definitely i'll keep an eye out for other trainings of yours i definitely would love to do more fantastic fantastic so david i'm hopeful that the the microphone um or the space issue so if you're sharing your space with somebody else if they could turn their microphone off or their speaker off hopefully we won't get any feedback go ahead i am not uh sharing my space with anyone um it was just that john paul had sent me the link and then i registered under under the link that he sent me and it grouped me in as as him uh i, I could talk to you afterwards about uh making sure i get credit but in regard yeah, to yeah, well, in, yeah. well, don't worry about that we'll work in, that out in regard to uh, facilitating a group, I got I got trial by fire. You know, I, I worked at a place in um, in Lakewood, and it was a peer processing group. It was all virtual, and they needed somebody because they had lost a lot of staff. And I got thrown in, and I'm a peer, and so it was mostly processing, and and it it was it worked out. And it, I'm in a different situation now. I'm at a mostly clinical clinical uh, place. And I'm bringing a, I'm starting a group on the 24th here. And my questions are mostly like, so they're, the staff at, at Sound is mostly uh, clinicians and I'm a peer and I have a, a wide variety of different experiences and I know what peer support is supposed to be. I just want to know how much um, it, it, to talk about how much, how much, clinical how much material to present to them as opposed to allow them to process because i want to be there for them to to process and and that safe space that's what the peer group at uh at at rainier recovery was um mm -hmm. and i and i want to create a similar space a safe space for them you know at the same time offering them a little bit of of, of uh insight and education as well yeah, David, really insightful questions, and I want to link them to what Bernard said earlier, because what you're really raising is what is the purpose of this group? Because let's be very clear, folks, regardless of the purpose of the group, regardless of the structure of the group, 
regardless of any of that, the role of the group facilitator is to set the climate and build safety within the confines of the group. Depending on what the purpose of the group is, will determine if it's a psychoeducational group, if there's information or content that's going to be discussed in the group. If it's a processing or a mutual aid support group, very similar to what Bernard shared with us, that it became a men's issues group where men got to talk about their experience of being men and various issues came up that people could talk about. So it depends on what is it that you're trying to accomplish by bringing this group of people together. And then that will determine the structure of the group, whether there's educational information, whether there isn't educational information, whether you, you know, how you facilitate the group, they'll impact all of that. So before we go to Ange Angela, a Angela, is it? Yes, Angela, Angelia? Angelia. Angelia, before we go to Angelia, David, do you have any follow-up question or response to what I, a reaction to what I just said? Just thank you. Thank you very much for, for I, I, I wrote as much as I could catch. I, I wrote it down and I appreciate you. Yeah, sure. And and we're and David, we're going to talk more about this as we go forward. And hopefully the slide deck will offer you some structure to answer some of those questions. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Good. So glad you're here. Angelia, thank you so much. You're, the floor is yours. And then we're going to go to Steve. And Adis is back with us. So Angelia, the floor is yours. Go right ahead. So when I started, um, I had um, training in uh, group facilitation. But when I started the particular group, um, it was two different groups that I started in. I had never done that particular group before. One was an Alzheimer's group and one was a um, substance abuse you know, um, group. And um, I had never done those before. And both of those, I was thrown in because they needed a body there to facilitate the group. Yep. And so what I did was one, you know, um, I had been a part, I had watched the groups before. And so I kind of just modeled it. And then I also um, researched on my own, like, you know, um, one, to ensure that everybody gets a chance to speak, you know, make sure, you know, that I may maintain cohesion in the group, that no one gets out of hand. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I always came prepared to have a topic to talk about just mm -hmm. in case, you know, the group didn't start, you know, the conversation, you know, so um that that was my experience, but just being thrown in there, I'm like, okay, what if I fail? What if I, you know, hurt someone, you know, by something I said, and, you know, and I'm always cognizant of that, and I try not to do that. But you know, you never you never know with the people that you're dealing with. So, um, so yeah, that that just helped me. You know, I did my own research prior to, and I had a lot of anxiety around it, but I got through it, and it worked out fine. And you know people came up to me afterwards, you know, talking to me about some of the, you know, resources and what have you, I gave them, but it was a good experience for me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Angelia. And again, I want to underline some, uh, a real strength that Angelia just shared with us, which is pre-group preparation. The fact that you did your own research, that you observed what was going on, that you were prepared if there wasn't something on the table. That's all pre-group preparation. Thanks thanks so much for sharing that process. Steve, the floor is yours, and then we're going to go to Adidas. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, hi, I just appreciate David uh, doing the peer work there. Oh, that's important. and. Um, when it comes to like psycho ed and groups, my general opinion is that I want to keep psycho ed components pretty short uh, so that the group can chew on the material. And then the, the, that's when the real learning happens, the application and or even the resistance that you actually sort of need to encounter sometimes in groups, in my experience. So um, so like just in the design part, I, 
you know, I'll have some benchmarks of psychoed goals for a group that are, you know, essential. I think I want these people at the end of this group to know these five things, maybe or yep. whatever. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and so, so that's a target. But as far as the amount of time in the actual group process, I usually try to minimize that. And the, and the magic happens in the in the debriefing. Like, well, you know, talk to your partner about if you believe that, you know, or if you disagree, you know. So then you get into the meaty processing stuff. And of course, that's based on having a safe group. And substance use groups in particular, you know, we're all, any of us who have had a substance use disorder or know someone with one, they're master avoiders. So uh, it happens in groups too, you know, let's avoid talking about this. Let me undermine this, distract from this. And so there's a whole bunch of skills for that, that reality too. But uh, anyway, just I'm glad we're here and this is, this is cool. Good work. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. And before we go to Addis, I just want to underline, Steve is pointing out something that is unique to groups and i and again steve i love the way you pointed it out because you pointed it out based on your own experience of facilitation and i want to underline what i'm hearing steve point out here and i'm going to make a bold statement before i point out what steve is illuminating Here's the bold statement, and some people might not like this statement, but I'm going to make it anyway. So here's the bold statement. Group participants come for the other participants in the group. They don't attend the group for the facilitator. I'm going to repeat that. I'm glad Kelly at least agrees with me on that. <laughs> group participants come for the other participants. They don't come for the facilitator. And Vinard agrees with that as well. And I feel like Steve illuminated that and prompted me to want to say that. And Steve, if you disagree with that statement, please feel free to unmute and comment. Uh, I The reason I wanted to illuminate that, folks, is because that's why people come to groups. They come to the group, and I love the way Steve put it, the magic happens in their discussing with each other, not with hearing me cover a psychoeducational component in the group. Susan writes in the chat, I always tell participants that they are the experts in the room and I am just there to facilitate. Now, all right. So folks, I, 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 wanna, I wanna throw out two, two things in terms of I'm gonna make an I statement here and then we're gonna transition. Testing, over. testing, one, two, testing. Hear somebody talking, who is that? That's Addis. Okay, Addis, I hear you, go ahead. I'm so encouraged when I see the participation and you're a great facilitator. You didn't need to uh, throw out any credentials. You, just by speaking, you've been excellent. I can say that for one, from a person who graduated from the basics. Uh, I always had academia, I was trained, then I had a, a life calamity, which uh, uh, I, I later on recovered because of early education i was exposed to a lot of things early on i was granted a mentor who somehow in his group believed in me and started opening a pathway for me and um turned over the group he retired and he was one who humbled with the element of a stick uh some people use a prop as a way to focus the group. And a talking that's he, stick. Yep. <laughs> he had the almighty stick, a staff. And how we used to focus on the staff. David's got the staff. No, Steve's got it next. And there would be arguments, defenders. You have the judges. You have the uh, actors in groups. Groups have such a phenomenal dynamic. As it was said by one of the uh, participants, this is a magic. There's a spirit of the group, a power. Groups go back to time and mortal when man was first taking his steps. We realize the power, the healing 
properties that are in a group, even when the participants don't want to be there, it still comes out phenomenal. Groups are so powerful. So I, like someone also said, I've done a lot of research, continuously retrain, read. I'm one of those folks that have to see it in black and white so I can repeat it several times and I get the gist. And it's phenomenal how the shift has gone in group facilitation and in group dynamics, the better understandings that, as you said, it's so on time. They don't come for us. They don't necessarily come for the group. Uh, relapse prevention, uh, pre-diabetes, better nutrition, tobacco sensation. There's all so many topics that we're addressing now. But the thing is, as you said, the magic occurs when there's a connection with two or more people. And if there's a group of 20, you may have multiple connections, the little clicks we call them. But those are actually power dynamics because the folks there realize, A, I have an issue. B, I don't want to have this issue. And C, there is solutions. How about that? And then I don't even have to do anything. Facilitation means the ongoing movement, the properties of keeping it alive. How do we do that so the group, because I've also witnessed that mutual aid group, psychoeducational, they mm -hmm. dozen different reasons, which I don't need to get into, that's your territory, Paul. But it's amazing. I've always been amazed and watched. I love to travel. I've been to different countries, as you was naming. Shout out to my Puerto Rican peoples. Uh, <laughs> the way it's so similar in other cultures, African healing circles, Indian powwows or whatever you want to call it, no offense to anyone, as well as I witnessed and participated in Dutch ones in, in Yugoslavia. And mm -hmm. I was like blown away. I couldn't understand the language, but the spirit, the magic still happens. And one can recognize it in our facial and body, you know, uh, emotions and, and displays. We get excited, we get sad, the whole spectrum. But again, I, I'm a firm believer in this intervention. I work with adolescents, I work with adults, substance abuse, domestic violence, re-entry, the whole smorgasbord of, of issues. And I'm grateful for that priority because it's given me a slew of experience Mm -hmm. And uh, I get requests all the time because I'm bilingual uh, 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 to help and assist in formulating other groups, especially the mutual aids, which are really starting to take off in the past 10 years or so. So it's phenomenal. And I just want to say I'm so grateful to you, Paul, for all you've done and been doing and will continue to do in your uh, uh, endeavors to uh, uh, train and help folks understand what we're doing. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. And, you know, I have to give credit where credit is due because it was Steve who pointed out that that's where the magic happens. And, and I couldn't agree with the both of you more. And I, I will just throw out two things as we sort of make a transition into going a little deeper into some of this content, which is that you know, when I started to facilitate groups, I hadn't been trained beforehand. I was kind of thrown in like many of the people here. And I was left with a feeling very similar to the one that um, Tanya mentioned, like, like, you want me to do what? I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. So, so that was kind of the experience that I started with and I had to grow my confidence and most of that confidence growth happened through the doing of it and then the reflecting on what I did in supervision because I had a very good supervisor who was also a group worker and that's not always the case but I was fortunate I had a supervisor who was always who was a very skilled and experienced group worker and by the way, I also had to co-facilitate with her. So I had the opportunity to observe another group worker, and I learned from that. 
I will just throw out one other experience that I have, and I do want to comment on something that Steve said about psychoeducational groups, because a psychoeducational group has the educational responsibility, meaning that part of the group is devoted to possibly covering a bit of information or a bit of content. And I couldn't agree with Steve more in terms of that I used to do a 90 minute group for people who were newly diagnosed with HIV. It was a psychoeducational closed group that ran for 10 weeks. And through the course of delivering that group for over three and a half years in 10 week cycles, I learned, and I share, I think, a similar experience to Steve, that I dedicated only 15 of the 90 minutes to the review of the very specific educational content. And then the whole rest of the group was the group members talking with each other and digesting that content and exploring that content and what that content meant to them and making connections with each other to do that. So think about the balance of that, folks. You have 90 minutes and only 15 of it, I came to realize, it was only 15 minutes that was really, and, and sometimes not even the full 15 minutes because the participants did the work with each other. I just facilitated by offering them that, because again, that was a psychoeducational group. That was the responsibility of that group, which also was a mutual aid group as well. So just keeping that in mind. The last thing I'll say before we make the transition into the next slide is that I don't know if anybody's ever had this experience. And if you have, type the letter Y in the chat. Have you ever inherited a group from somebody else? who like was leading the group and then you had to take the group over. Yes, so it seems like a few of us in the learning community have had that experience. Yeah, did somebody want to comment on that? Who who was speaking? Bernard was speaking and who else? Yeah. Tanya. Go ahead, Tanya. We'll go, we'll start with Tanya and then we'll go to Bernard. Go ahead, Tanya. Okay. Um, thank you. I just want to say that's exactly what ended up happening because one of my, the facilitator I was learning from was gone and then it was like okay tanya jump in i'm like jump into what like what, what you know i wasn't i i didn't feel prepared and and yeah. to me that's nerve-wracking mainly because the facilitator was so popular with the group it made me feel like oh my god what am i entering am i gonna be and am i gonna be you know good enough am i gonna you know get through like she's been getting through because i was i was yeah. very amazed by this facilitator and the way she worked with the people and as co-facilitator i didn't have to do much i just was mainly observing so when that happened I, it was a very overwhelming feeling and that's what i was saying before yeah you know will you be as good as the next person and so you're sitting mm -hmm. like, okay. mm -hmm. so what i did is i was like somebody said make it your own that's what i did i i i, I did all her the usual you know welcomed everybody what if i got the cues the little just yeah. a couple of cues that I had to get professionally. But then yeah. I was like, how do I make it my own? And so for me, I began every group with an affirmation, something that I like to do at home mm -hmm. uh, for myself and for my yeah. daughter. I use affirmations to start everything, my day, a little quick prayer, you know, not prayer because everybody's different about religion, but I think affirmations cover everyone. And yeah. that's how I would begin my groups and it became my thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Bernard, go ahead. I think the same thing. I mean, I took over for somebody else. You know, I kind of, I was able to watch him a couple of times, but, you know, I kind of, when I took over, I took one of the things I did. We we met every two weeks, once every two weeks, and, and it was yeah. usually for like a two-hour session. So we had a two-hour session. We fed him and, and everything else, you know. So a lot of times when people ask, you know, where are you coming for the group for? I said, you know, we're going to feed your belly, feed your soul, feed your mind, and, 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 and go for that. So, I mean, I was able, I took some of the things that we did that, because we would meet every two weeks, usually our greeting was, you know, reintroduce yourself and tell us what happened in the last two weeks, your previous two weeks when you came back. And and and, and then whatever, like I said, again, if they had a topic, we would just discuss it and like everybody else, I'd kind of prepare. And one, my co-facilitator was actually one of the 
one of our clients who had HIV. So he, we were able to, we worked together as far as what we were going to talk about group discussions and, and, and stuff. And, and, and then we, and how we made it our own. I made it my own towards the end. We, we, we did the serenity prayer. We closed it out by doing the serenity prayer. So that's how we closed it out uh, for us. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Addis, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thanks, Paul. Uh, same way. I had I, I mentioned it briefly. I want to give a recognition to John Hemmers, who was a very illustrious uh, criminal figure and wrote a book about changing your life. And mm -hmm. he started off with the power of the group, totally believed, immersed, though he, he worked his way up to a clinician. He didn't mm -hmm. want to do clinical work per se. He stuck with the groups. And as I said earlier, he mentored me, uh, was retiring. He was an older gentleman, even at the time, and worked into his 80s effectively. So mm -hmm. I understand what Angelique was saying about if it was, I apologize if I got the wrong person. Uh, I was afraid he was this colorful guy yep. you know, who just by his name, folks gave tremendous amount of respect to because of his journey. Yeah. Like we knew he was a very, you know, uh, infamous type of guy. But he said something to me that moved and gave me the confidence. He said, even in the group, your will and your participation was a moving force. And you'll see those movers in the group. And all you have to do is make an alliance with them, per se, and they'll run the group for you. It's mm -hmm. really almost self-run, mm -hmm. especially if it's psychoeducational. Like you said, it's a brief, brief introduction, cover of material that nine out of ten times folks have in their toolkit already. Right. We're rephrasing, reflecting and re-emphasizing certain points to illustrate the purpose of the purpose of the group. And that's covered quickly. But the intergroup dynamic, which can seem as times, and you almost said it, antagonistic. We have the resistors, of course, always, but then you have folks who just battle with things. And we can misread that as a resistant person, when in all actuality, they're just in their five, the fourth or, or, you know, three and a half point phase of the five stage of, uh, 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 movement. They're, they're, they're in contemplate, past contemplation. Mm -hmm. They're in action. They're mm -hmm. actually doing something. But that resisting the questions, which can seem, you know, again, a, a, of a, the resistant help, it's not actually that. It's really dynamics of the group and yep. people exerting what their their energy is into the issues and that one has to recognize and i believe commend because these are the folks who really make it to long-term cover a uh, recovery in whatever realm because of their energy of wanting the desire for change yeah yeah man. yeah, sure. yeah. and because they're doing the work mm, they're actually bingo. struggling with the issue yes. in the frame of the group Right, right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you. So, so folks, keeping all that in mind, let me share my screen. And thank you so much for answering those questions because that's a way for you to refresh your sort of relationship to groups. You know, group work, well, you know, being clear that it's it's a type of intervention, just like individual counseling is an intervention that involves one or more facilitators. And if you're if you've had the opportunity to co-facilitate, type the letter Y in the chat. If you've only flown solo, type the letter S in the chat for solo. So if you've co-facilitated, type the letter Y. If you've only flown solo in lead groups by yourself, type S in the chat for solo. And I just want to throw out that I've done both. And to, I'll be quite honest, I much prefer co-facilitation. And I'll say why as we go forward into this conversation. 
I've done both. I, I believe I have the capacity to do both. And I much prefer co-facilitation. And again, I will say more about that as we go forward. And keeping in mind that groups have hopefully overall purposes or goals. They can take place in a variety of locations. There can be clinical groups, there can be process groups, there can be mutual aid groups. They can happen in all different settings and all different places. And they are often considered part of comprehensive treatment that can include sometimes individual therapy as well as medication so that people can be experiencing three different modalities they can be involved in case management they can be or four they can be involved in individual therapy with a therapist they can also be a member of the group and they may also have medication that they're possibly taking and a group intervention is as unique as any of the others and as addis and others have said there's a certain kind of synergy or power that can come out of being in a group. And, and I will also underline, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen as I do this, I wanna underline something that Addis said because I couldn't agree with him more. Also the idea that yes, the groups may be titled, you know, uh, relapse prevention groups. And yes, maybe that's the, that's the coalescing issue it's not necessarily the issue that keeps the person in the group. It's the person's connection with other people in the group, that they are a member of that group. So keep in mind that the, the topic may be the coalescing factor. It may be the thing that brings the group together. It's the linkages or the connection that we help facilitate and foster that actually creates the people coming back to the group and may, and helps the people. Yeah, and and Carrie, your Carrie's noted. I I I don't know if people saw what Carrie wrote in the chat, but my problem is finding clients to participate. Yeah, and, and recruitment for groups is a whole other topic that we could spend three hours alone on, like recruitment strategies, how to recruit for a group, when to know when to start a group, what's the best group for the population? What are the, and keep in mind folks, that prior to the purpose of a group, well, I'll ask it this way. I'm gonna ask a question instead of making a statement. Prior to the purpose, of a group what comes before the purpose of a group what do you think what comes before determining the purpose of a group sandra writes attendance to group is a major issue yeah and raymond chris yes it's the need that you identify a particular need and let me be very specific. And I know we're, we're going off on a little bit of a tangent by saying this, but it's relevant, which is this, I wanna be very specific. I mentioned to you that I led a group that was for people who were newly diagnosed with HIV. And it was a short-term closed psychoeducational group. The reason that that group got developed was because the programs that I were connected to were connected to an HIV testing center. And we found after 1996, when there was highly active antiretroviral therapy that was effective in that first year, the death rate was cut by a full 50%. We found that when people were getting diagnosed with HIV, after 1996, there was an extra element of despair or guilt that people felt becoming infected. So my colleagues and I sat down and had a conversation about 
what would be the best way to meet this need? And one of the things we thought was, let's develop a group that's for people who are diagnosed within the first year of their diagnosis, and they've been diagnosed after 1996. And that's how it started. And then we, we identified that particular need, and then we identified what are the educational components that would be relevant to that particular need. That was before we ever recruited anybody. We identified that need and we started to develop the structure of the group, okay? So the need determines the purpose. The purpose starts to shape out what the structure of the group is going to be. Is the group going to be opened? Is the group going to be closed? Will there be a psychoeducational component? Will there not be a psychoeducational component? How long will the group last? What is the best place to put the group? That's before any recruitment ever takes place. So just keep in mind, that's part of that pre-group planning that we want to have in place so that we're building something that's actually meeting a need. And, and sometimes recruitment problems are that you have groups that don't really address or meet a specific need of the people you're trying to market the group to. That's not always the case, but sometimes it is the case that you're, you're using an existing structure that there's no longer a need for. So just keeping that in mind, and I just wanted to underline that given where we were. Group participants are great recruiters as well. Yes, Bernard, absolutely. Because that word of mouth can be a wonderful way. And, and, and Bernard, since you wrote that, before we go back to the slide, I do want to just add one other thing. You inspire me to add one other thing, which is, in addition to what Bernard said, that group members themselves can actually act as recruiters for your group that meeting with prospective group participants before they're admitted to the group or before the group starts is also a wonderful way. And that's that pre-group interview. And we used to do that with every candidate for a group. And it's, trust me, you may be saying like, what, is Paul crazy? No, well, maybe, but no, I don't think so. It was it was actually just part of our standard process that every person that was being considered for a group had a pre-group interview. So yeah, Jennifer Heather agrees. We we met with everybody, Heather, and that's how we determined a whether group was going to be the right intervention for them, and b what kind of group might be the best group for them to be in. So just throwing that out there is something for you to consider. And again, I couldn't agree with Bernard more that the idea that other group members can also act as your recruiting agents. I'm gonna share my screen again. So, you know, this is a whole list of things. Oh, hold on a second. A whole list of things that are the benefits of group, support, safety, encouragement, and all these other bullets that are here. I, I wanna throw out something, and Addis really inspires me to say this, um, based on the, um, the energy and the passion with which he shared uh, his, his uh, support of group as a method. My, my group mentor, Dr. George Getzel, used to say that, life is lived in groups and the power of a group um, is like no other power I think and that's why I love groups as a, a method of intervention um, because it's a very different kind of energy than the energy of uh, individual therapy and group participants can offer each other 
a kind of support, a kind of energy, a kind of presence that the facilitator actually can't. But the facilitator holds and maintains the space wherein which the group can actually come together, stay safe, and actually do their work. So yes, these are multiple benefits. And there are lots of reasons, you know, why groups are advantageous. And I'll tell you, the thing that's funny is the third bullet is the one that a lot of people focus on, that they're cost effective. And, and be cautious of that. Because when somebody says, well, let's do groups, because we can bill, we can have the worker doing groups and then bill for multiple, I would throw out for consideration that when people are thinking about groups for their efficiency, they're missing the point about the power of group as an intervention. And yes, the reality is, is they can be very cost effective and they offer a kind of support and power that participants can't get anywhere else. And I will, I'm going to stop sharing my screen to underline this. I'll also invite you to consider that for some individuals, this may be the first time they're in a group experience where they are safe, where they are respected, where they're given an opportunity to share their voice, and where they're given an opportunity to take on a role, possibly being vulnerable. So a group can provide an opportunity for someone to try on things that maybe they didn't experience before. So just, just keeping that in mind. And beware when somebody says, yeah, we're gonna do groups because they're cost effective. And that is true, they are. And we wanna make sure that people understand why we're choosing a group intervention. So, the importance of group guidelines and agreements, expectations, or rules. Before I share any of the bullets that will follow under that, does anybody want to comment on that? What, what, you know, why do groups need group guidelines? Why do we want to have guidelines, rules, agreements in place for any group? What are your thoughts about that? Go ahead, Forrest. Yeah, go ahead. And then we'll go to Tracy. Go ahead, Forrest. Well, for one, you can't have the group being willy nilly, right? Okay. Every, if we can all, for best example I can give, right? Um, the one mic rule, okay? We can all sing together and make beautiful music, but when we talk together, it's garbage. So that's my example. Or I will say this one diva, no background singer. I don't know. <laughs> that's just the way that it is. When I'm up here, I'm Beyonce. When I pass you the mic, you can be Kelly or Michelle, but I don't want to hear my voice. So those rules help keep us on track of what we're doing. And we've also added that we you can add to the rules and you can take away from the rules. The rules are nonlinear. Yep, yep. And they're ev they're evolving. They're, they can grow, they can shrink. Go ahead, John Paul. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that, uh, well, you know, the answer to your question, why, why group rules and requirements, um, there's, a, there's a whole slew of reasons, but um, some of the, the reasons that come to mind um, include... Um, Hello? Uh, yep, you're there, oh, Tracy. Sorry. sorry. Go ahead, John Paul, and then we'll go to Tracy and then to Carrie. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so uh, gr group, uh, so group cohesion... Right, so everybody's uh, coalescing around uh, same uh, same understanding. It creates a co continuity and consistency of understanding about what uh, about how people are going to conduct themselves in there. So then, so then there isn't as much uh, room for you know um, having behaviors or interjections or, or, or people show up with all kinds of things that would be 
unexpected or, or would would be perceived as disrespectful it, it, it increases respect and lowers lowers disrespect increases okay. inclusion uh, okay. decreases exclusion and then most of all the thing that strikes me is that um if you have the, if the if clients continue to go to the group they're going to be the ones who continue to they're going to be the ones who kind of enforce it and, and talk about those rules in group so it it, it becomes more of a, a shared responsibility and a shared yep. perpetuation yep. of these rules rather than just the facilitator being the lightning rod it becomes a, a cultural community in enforcement of these are our values these are our, our ideals and this is how we function in this group fantastic and they become and john paul tell me if i've gone too far by saying this they become part of the identity of the group uh that's right uh the, are the you okay with that yeah they get re they, they reinforce uh that the, these are, our, are are the values that we identify with um yes. in this group yeah. yes yeah and they help build and contribute to that identity it. thank you yeah thank you thank you tracy i see you've worked it out go ahead um i was just gonna basically agree with what everyone has just stated already one um the one mic rule is so important because oh my goodness every time i'm in a group it's like i love that we're all talking but it's like 10 of y'all at the same time i don't even know what's going on um also we want to um we want to set the tone for what's appropriate especially if we're going to be talking about really heavy topics or uncomfortable topics or maybe things that people have different views on um, we want to just make sure that the behavior is um is good and it's falling on line where people also feel comfortable and not judged so that's one of the biggest things that i emphasize with group is because a lot of the times my participants, um, this may be the first time that they're in group in their whole life, and it's um, it's going to be the first time that they may be in group with other people. So they often don't feel comfortable that they can just, you know, come to group and be like, my life is all over the place because they don't know the people. So they want to, so we want to kind of set the tone to build a relationship that way that they can feel comfortable to contribute. And like John Paul said, basically, um, have it become their identity, take over the group and really reinforce group. So I find that um, giving them the creating uh, the group guidelines that are important and then giving them the role that they can just create their own uh, rules to add to the group guidelines just makes it more of a stronger intervention and the outcome is just greater when I am working with students and we establish those. Fantastic, thank you, Tracy. Carrie, go ahead, the floor is yours. Carrie's on Hi. Uh, Hi. <laughs> I just um our community I am doing a lot of virtual work yeah and, um, with virtual groups this is kind of newer to our facility and stuff like that and what I was finding is there was a very large need to understand what that etiquette was for something completely new um as going when i went to southwestern university they had this really weird thing where they invited you to dinner so you could learn fine dining etiquette hmm. and <laughs> it was interesting to learn like okay this is the fork you use with this this is i don't know how the heck this really goes into all of like the whole thing of being you know in um the recovery field but um but what it taught me was these are the tools to use and how to use them. A lot of people show up driving in cars and not being safe. Um, a lot of people would show up to the groups totally loaded. Um, mm. And it does create a safe place right. um, for people to recover right. if they don't have some sort of structure. What I'm finding is that they really like the structure once they are a part of the structure. Yes. Uh, they are the ones who like to actually talk about the group rules. Um, mm -hmm. They are the, we, we create that, like she had just said, we, they create their own rules, um, you know, sometimes in our groups and, and we add them to what we talk about each week mm -hmm. because it really shows, you know, what is engagement? What is showing you're engaged in this you know what is your expectations and what do you expect out of me mm -hmm. so Excellent. um it's really good to lay that on the line ahead of time 
I couldn't agree with you more. And and I also really appreciate that you're linking groups and John Paul did this as well as Tracy. The idea that group guidelines or parameters are part of the culture of the group. And they and people take on and own that culture and then sort of carry it forward. And just before we go to uh, Fulakimi, I just want to underline something that David wrote in the chat. Because David, I think that what you wrote is, in addition to what everybody else has written, but I just want to underline, I think what you wrote was very insightful because it speaks to the role of the facilitator. David wrote, we as facilitators must respect the guidelines first and foremost. And to David's point, we also have to model them. Because how, talk about the height of sort of, unclear communication if we're expecting and asking the group to engage in particular behaviors that we're not modeling ourselves modeling behaviors mm -hmm. yes trace tanya we yeah. we have to model them as the facilitator as well i think that's why i was saying to you earlier about um i had mentioned something about open-ended questions and you know how I like to, when I conduct the group or just try to get the feel for the environment of their group, I'm just trying, first I start to ask certain questions and I'm introducing myself and I'm trying to see who's going to be the talkers, who's going to be the quiet ones, who's hmm, looking around like what time is it or who's on their phones all the time. Yep. I'm trying to gauge the group before I talk and I talk about something else to see if I could draw them in so that when I talk, start talking, I'm like, I need to get to a place where the person feels comfortable enough to begin to open up as well. And I think why that works for us, I think as a whole eventually is that this, this person, and it happened to me, you'll carry that on in other places, not just in the group, but if we're modeling certain behaviors and you know, there's a respect in the group and the way we, we, we're communicating with, with one another and we're getting through, I think that person will then carry that on to other places where they go, you know what I mean? And in yes. hopes that they'll get the same type of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? In hopes that they'll get the same type of, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't find the word guys, but you know what I'm saying. All right, All right. well, if the word comes to you, <laughs> shout it out. But, and I, I just want to underline something that, and Fulikimi, don't lose your thought, but I just want to underline that Tanya is also pointing out that when a group member internalizes a group culture, it goes with them outside of the group. And that's part of what you're hoping for. You're hoping for that if they learn to let somebody else talk before they jump in and i'm giving one very minute small thing which is actually a very big thing that they'll carry that into other parts of their life so groups how they participate in a group becomes a microcosm of what they can bring to their outside life the floor is yours finally thank you so much for your patience Fulakimi. And I believe that rules enhance accountability. When, uh, you know, when rules outline expectations yes. for individual contribution, members of the groups are more likely to take ownership of their actions and their commitment. Yes, yes. And they really can't because you know what you're accountable for. Mm -hmm. It's clear. It's straightforward. And if if we don't sort of follow through on that, we can remind ourselves or maybe other people in the group may say, hey, wait a minute, our guideline is this. That's right. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen again, folks. Now, one thing I will throw out for, for folks to consider about group guidelines, um, because some people were talking about uh, rituals or practices about how you begin a group or how you end a group. What I can tell you, and I'm giving you one specific example, I'm making an I statement from my own experience. 
the HIV, uh, newly diagnosed HIV group that I used to lead, that I developed and that I led for a little over three and a half years, one of the ways we always began that group was we read out the group guidelines. That was a ritual that was for our group. And, you know, it got to the point as we were doing that through the 10 week cycle where people no longer even needed to look at the handout that had the written guidelines on them. And it just became part of the culture of those groups that I carried forward where we read the group guidelines out loud. And that was part of the way we began. So first and foremost, group guidelines, of course, contribute to establishing Tanya writes, uh, after all what people learn in a group becomes a part of their own personal toolbox. Absolutely, 100%. Couldn't agree with that more. Safety, they also can help focus the group and they can help create a transition from before what happened outside of the group to being in the group. They also can support momentum for the group moving through its stages of development and for its ability to do its work. And we've already talked about some of the other reasons uh, to have guidelines and some of the benefits. Far more interesting than you know these four bullets that are on there. So I, I wanna throw out something for all of us to consider. And then I think we're gonna take a 15 minute break and then come back and start to bring our conversation to a close. But I, I wanna ask everybody to think about essential guidelines. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because I think you have a vision of that knot that was there. But I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I want to I want to throw this out for your consideration. And a number of people alluded to this. And I love the fact that they identified this. And Forrest, you, you said that other people alluded to it, but you said it, I, I think, most directly, which is that group members can be invited and can be part of the process of developing and refining their group guidelines and that we can engage them in that process of identifying what's important to them, what those group guidelines are. Many of us refer to that and Forrest, you really kind of called that out, you know, in terms of the process of it. So what I wanna invite everybody to think about for just a moment, is if you were going to walk into a group setting before you invite the participants to contribute to what they think the guidelines should be, what the expectations or the rules should be, if you were gonna walk into the situation with your three top guidelines that you would walk into the group with, what would those three top guidelines be from your perspective as a facilitator? So just frame that in your mind and come up with three, three top group guidelines. Okay. Tracy, do you have your three? You got them? Okay, good. So Tracy, um, we're going to start. Hold on. Hold on just one second. Don't, don't go yet. <laughs> okay. Hold on just one second. Okay. So, and Forrest, do you have your top three? Okay, fantastic. And is there, a, yeah, Tanya, you have your top three? Okay, all right. So everybody get your top three. Now, what I'm gonna ask, we'll start with Tracy, we'll go to Forrest and then we'll go to Tanya. What I'm gonna ask, and then I'll invite anybody else who wants to comment, but what I'm gonna ask is Tracy, revisit your top three and pick your top one. And I want Tanya and Forrest to do the same. And what I'm gonna also ask you to be able to do is explain why it's your top one. So Tracy, tell us your top one and tell us why it's your top one as a group facilitator. And Forrest, I'm gonna ask you to do the same. 
Tanya, I'm going to ask you to do the same, and then I'll invite anybody else who wants to share their top one and say why. And I'm asking you to say why from the facilitator's perspective. Okay? So, Tracy, you, the floor is yours. You start us off. We'll go to Forrest. We'll go to Tanya. And then we'll go to the other folks. Go ahead, Tracy. All right, y'all. So, my top, top... Um, group facilitator it, it was hard because I had to go between two but I my know. top <laughs> my top one um it would have to be a uh, safe space and um that is a group facilitator uh rule that I actually had when I was a student in high school from my facilitator okay. and the reason why I feel that creating or this is like establishing that this is a safe space is very important is because people need to feel comfortable and respected in the group uh, when we're when multiple people it's very easy to like shy away or somebody could say something like oh that is so dumb and you, it could deter like anybody from wanting to share their perspective or the person who's speaking can now lose um, confidence in just sharing out maybe not even wanting to go to group anymore and in my current position I've experienced like that happening and you know having to step in as a facilitator to remind people like people are different um, they have different lifestyles backgrounds regardless of that we should be respectful of it because if there if people don't feel comfortable there's no participation there's just no group dynamic and that that family oriented aura doesn't happen um because people don't feel comfortable so i feel like that is something that i always 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 stress in any of my groups um especially if you disagree with someone's like political um preference sexual orientation religion whatever the case may be mm -hmm. this is not the space to disrespect anybody and i let that know that is absolutely not allowed and they um, my participants know that that is very serious and they actually appreciate me being like the person to reinforce that um and then they also reinforce it themselves because it just allows them to feel comfortable if they feel like the whole world is against them group should not be another place for that they should be able to breathe and relax and share and build community so that's why I always tell people like safe space that is a non-negotiable rule that is a rule that we spend a lot of time explaining what that means and that is something I reinforce with every single meeting fantastic Tracy thank you so much for starting us off no problem yeah Forrest the floor is yours top number one and then we're going to go to Tanya and then we'll go to Folakimi go ahead okay okay so this is an addendum to the one mic rule. We like to use what we call weight. Why am I talking? So we want people to think before you speak. Have, you, have your thoughts together before you start saying anything in the group. And it also helps with the one mic rule because you're going to think before you speak. Forrest, thank you so much. Tanya? Okay, hi everyone. I think um, my number one, after all of them, is respect for culture, language, and gender. Because so many people come into our groups from different backgrounds, different language, different culture practices. And I always say that in the beginning of every group, please be mindful and respectful of the people that are around you because they may speak a certain way or practice certain, you know, certain type of um, cultural preference. That's their preference, you know. So we have to always be mindful of respect for culture, language, and gender. That's my number one. And to me, that that um, piggybacks on all others because in a space like that, you're safe by by putting that out there. You're in a safe space. So I like that the safe safe space idea. I like the wait idea because I was like, hmm, wait, why am I talking? I like that too, because again, certain cultures, it's eye contact, certain cultures is non-contact, you know, it's yeah. not verbal cues. So yeah, I think that I covered the entire thing and that's why I'm always about, can we respect people? Can we respect one another's culture, language and gender? So that way everyone feels safe in a space where we are about to begin, you know, turn yeah. okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. And Laura, um, after Raymond, just unmute. Don't worry about raising your hand. Just unmute, and then you can share what you want to share. So, Lakini, go ahead, and then we're going to go to Raymond, and then to Laura. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, so, um, I believe in conflict resolution. So, I believe that um, when you establish a clear process of addressing and uh, resolving conflicts, 
it's encouraged open dialogues and um, to discuss issues as they arise and seek um, solution collaboratively, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, conflicts are inevitable. That's one thing in a group, certain group of people. So, but yeah. having a structure, you know, yeah. approach to resolution is to help prevent escalation and maintain a position of group dynamic, you know, this rule will foster on a safe um, environment for everyone where members feel comfortable enough to discuss their disagreements and also finding a common ground. So it's fantastic. All. Yeah. And, you know, it also serves the purpose of normalizing the fact that, hey, we're not always going to get along. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Raymond, the floor is yours. And Laura, I see you figured out how to raise your hand. Go ahead. But you didn't need to. You could just unmute. Go ahead, Raymond. The floor is yours. Hi, yeah, so I just wanted to, um, this um, phrase that we use often, um, a safe space, <clears throat> right? So, um, first, I just want to agree with, I believe it was Tanya that had said, you know, with respect, right, is one of the things that helps create a space that would be safe. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I do when we talk about group guidelines and, and a safe, making it safe is, it's up to the group and each, every per each person to, to make it safe. I, as a facilitator, can support it, but I can't make it a safe space for yeah. everyone because yeah. it's up to each individual to decide for themselves if that group is safe for them, if the space is safe, especially yeah. when we're talking about things like trauma and whatnot, yeah. right? So I deal a yeah. lot with that. So yeah. it's um, it's really up to each individual now. Um, but even if a group is mandated, still every person should have their agency to say, mm -mm, Whatever is happening, whatever is being said, I don't feel safe. I need to get up and step out. And we talk about that and how people can do that, yeah. collect themselves and come back in yep. or things like that. But I think that's kind of an important thing to um, let everyone remember that they have agency. And yes. and um, the, only they can decide if it's a safe space. But we work together to try to create a space that feels safe for yes. everyone as best we can. Yeah, without the guarantee of it that it's going to be safe. Exactly, because yeah, some people could just say, oh, you said this was a safe space and this person just said this and it triggered me, but that person may not have known that that was necessarily going to be a trigger, especially That's in right. regards to trauma. That's right. And I, I also just want to link that that agency, that self-agency, the ability to exercise your autonomy contributes to safety. Because if I need to get up and step away for a moment in order to feel safe, or if I need to say, I'm done for today for safety, that's because safety is not guaranteed. You can't guarantee that. We can do everything we can to make sure, but we can't guarantee it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Raymond. Laura, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello. So for me, the number one would definitely be confidentiality, but also to go with that, the um, the confines of confidentiality that, you know, that there are certain things that aren't going to remain confidential, because I think that's really important to the trust of the group and them trusting me in that very start. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's very similar, Laura, what you're saying is very similar to what Raymond said, because we can't guarantee confidentiality. We can ask everybody to offer it. We can ask everybody to respect it, but we don't police everybody that's in the group. So people need to exercise their autonomy about what they will choose to share or not share. Right. And I think in that, as the, the facilitator myself, what my constraints are is to what is shared when talking about self-harm. Um, yes. abuse to somebody else, abuse to themselves, knowing that those are That's things right. that do not remain confidential. That's right. I'm a mandated reporter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So folks, before we take our break, and we're going to take a 15, a brief 15 minute break, we'll take a full 15 minutes. And I, and I thank you for your focus and hanging in there for the time that we've, we've been together so far. But before we take that 15 minute break, I want to make one observation. But before I make the observation, I want to thank everybody who spoke, who unmuted and shared their top number one. And I want to thank everybody who wrote in the chat 
about it because I want you to keep in mind that you actually made a self-disclosure there. You told us something about yourselves as group facilitators because you shared from your experience, from your value set, you shared with us what you see as a priority to creating a safe, as safe as it can be, a confidential, as confidential as it can be, group environment. And you'll notice that not one of you said it the same way. And all of you were essentially communicating the same, similar sort of values, beliefs, and sentiments. So just, just keep that in mind that, you know, when we are facilitators, when we are facilitating, chances are we are going to walk in with what we see as basic, basic guidelines, expectations, or rules for the group. And to Forrest and others' point, we do want to make sure that we are inviting group members to comment on those, to explore those, and to add to those. Because we are creating as much safety as we can possibly create together. Elizabeth writes in the chat, absolutely, we cannot guarantee uh, how the energy will be in the group. Uh, learning to give a person their space. Also, if you need to leave the group, a person should be allowed following up individually with group members is also important. Uh, yes, David, we can certainly assure that because your name is is in the chat. And uh, when you get the evaluation, just complete that. And David, just be clear, also put your email address uh, privately in the chat to me as well. Um, understood, Elizabeth, not, not a problem. So folks, at this particular juncture, we're going to take a 15-minute break. Please do not log out. Stay logged in, but feel free to turn your cameras off and we'll see you in 15 minutes and we'll start to bring our conversation to a resting point. I don't want to say conclusion, but we'll have 15 minutes and uh, please enjoy your break. Thank you. Excellent. I think we're back. Uh, we're hearing some fascinating background music. <laughs> Not sure what that is, but uh, it's stirring nonetheless. Welcome back. Hope that you had a good 15 minute break. So folks, let me share my screen with you and we will start to identify some of the specific skills. And again, just to reiterate, as we transition into this, the idea that we want to be very clear about what we see as essential guidelines, and that we can also collaboratively engage in a conversation with group members about what they see as guidelines. And as Jean-Paul said, and other people have said, that the guidelines actually can become part of the culture of the group, and that group members internalize them, and then, uh, welcome back, Teresa. Thank you um, for letting me know. And that they can then carry these things into contexts outside of the group as well. Now, I want to just say a few things about the purpose of the purpose. And what I mean by the purpose of the purpose is the purpose of the group's purpose. And I will just throw out for your consideration these few things. They can answer the question of why are we together? What are we doing while we're together? I.e., what is the work? And what are we getting out of being together? And it keeps everything on track, focused, and I really want to emphasize the word intentional. And just keeping that in mind, the idea that we can be intentional 
about what we're doing. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen to just highlight a few other points about the group purpose. We established earlier that the group purpose is really crafted or generated from the identified need. So if the identified need is, and I'm going to use, you know, the example that I've used as we've been talking, if the identified need is to provide an opportunity for people who are within the first year of their diagnosis of HIV disease to come together, if we're identifying that is the need, we would then build the purpose of the group based on trying to address that need. So the need we have is we want to bring people who are newly diagnosed with HIV. We want to give them the opportunity to be together, to have contact with each other. Now, I'm going to ask everybody to imagine just for the purposes of this activity, I'm going to ask you to imagine that you're somebody who just found out you're diagnosed with HIV. And what I'm going to ask you to consider is that if that's the case, and you were going to be around other people who were, and I'm going to put it this way, in the same boat or having the same experience as you were, what might you want out of being in that place with other people that are in that place? And, it, and just whatever comes to your mind, type it in the chat. What If you were a person who was newly diagnosed and you were going to be around other people, you possibly wouldn't want to be judged. What else? Thank you. Uh, excellent. Let me just read a few of these out loud. Um, reassurance that life continues. Validation that feelings are normal, typical. Their initial feelings. Empathy, respect, guidance, other perspectives. Uh, you might be experiencing fear and you might want to have a place to be able to put that out. You might want understanding. Uh, fantastic. What you are doing right now, folks, ways of living, what works for them, validation, understand, am I going to die answering that question? Yeah. Other people having struggles. So what you're engaging in right now is a process that my group professor used to call empathic projection. That's not on one of the slides, but I want to share that with you peer support, coping skills, a safe place to vent. Absolutely. I want to share this with you because this can be a very helpful process for us to engage in if we're developing a group. Because remember, developing the group is determining what the group purpose is. And the, the process is called empathic projection where you imagine yourself in that person's shoes and you frame out what might they need or want if they were in that place. So then you can start to develop a statement, the purpose of this group is to provide a non-judgmental, safe space to share my feelings and to get information about how to live with the diagnosis of HIV. So do you see the connection between kind of imagining what people may need and then starting to frame out the group purpose? And Forrest writes, people talk to me, at, yeah, for people to treat you like a human being, yeah, to talk to you like a human being. Absolutely. So you can start to develop the group purpose through this process of empathic projection. This is also where when you meet with prospective group members, and I'll give you again a concrete example. 
I mentioned to you that my program, what the group program was connected to a t HIV testing center. So people would test positive. They would be given their test results by a counselor. And the counselor would say, hey, I want to let you know there's a resource, if you're interested, that there's actually a group for people who were newly diagnosed. Would you be interested in talking with the group facilitator about what that group is and what that group does? Sometimes people would say, yeah, I want to talk to him. And they'd want to talk right then and there. Other times they'd say, I don't want to talk to anybody right now. I'm out of here. And maybe I'll come back later and talk. When they finally did talk to me, if they talked to me then or later, it was a further opportunity for me to have deeper insight into what that individual might need. And that started to present larger group themes. And I'm going to give a concrete example. One of the themes that became very apparent and this is not going to be a surprise to anybody who does work in regard to HIV and AIDS. And it's a little different now than it certainly was then. But one of the major issues, and it's probably also exactly the same, but one of the major issues was about disclosure of HIV status. So group that became one of the psychoeducational units in the 10 weeks was to talk about the process of disclosure and disclosing one's HIV status and deciding who you would disclose to and who you wouldn't disclose to and why you might make a disclosure or why you might not want to make a disclosure so again the connection that i want to make for you is identifying a need, empathic projection, screening prospective group members all help in the development and the crystallization of an effective group purpose. Because remember, the group is crafted in order to address these particular participants' needs. And that's an ideal structure. Sometimes we inherit groups. Sometimes groups don't have a clear purpose. Sometimes they have an overly clear purpose because they have an educational curriculum or content that is associated with them. So I just mentioned that and want to emphasize the group purpose because it shapes how you facilitate. Because you're not facilitating in a vacuum. You're facilitating as guided by the purpose. Because the purpose explains what the work of the group is. I'm going to share my screen again. And again, it answers these questions. Why we're together, what we're doing, the work of the group what we can expect to get out of the group. I'll give a concrete example. Decrease of isolation. Some people who were newly diagnosed at that time felt like they were the only one. And part of being in the group was being reminded, like, I'm not the only person who was just diagnosed. And again, it keeps everything clear for the participants, focused and intentional for them as well, as us as the facilitators. I wasn't sure if somebody wanted to unmute and say something. If you did, just jump in. All right, I, I just wanted to say that, go that ahead. Uh, as far as the group facilitators go, I think when sometimes when you co-host a group, it, it, is, it is essential to have someone that 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 kind of uh, meshes well with you when you uh when you facilitate the group. Uh, yeah. I've um I've had uh, I've been lucky to have people there with me uh, in the group setting that I've always meshed well with, and then we kind of we kind of understand each other and understand and and when I mean it's to the point now when 
when he's saying something and I, I just catch on right away and I I just continue what he's saying and no. I, I just try to add to the conversation. But I mean, I, I just wanted to say, you know, that adds to to the group uh, and, and the success of the group as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Terrell. And, and I'll tell you, um, if we had another three hours and we don't today, but if we had another three hours today, we could spend a full three hours talking about group co-facilitation. Because Terrell, I think you're absolutely right. Who you co-facilitate with, and sometimes you get a choice about that, and sometimes you don't get a choice about that. And what I can tell you is that co-facilitators need to do pre-group work in order to develop their co-facilitating relationship. And they also need to do post-group work to reflect. Would you agree with that, Terrell? Yeah, I would, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I would also add that they need to do post-group work because it's really important if Raymond and I are co-facilitating a group together, after that group, it's really good to do a debrief. Because there are going to be things that Raymond sees that I may miss and things that I miss that Raymond may, I think I just said that, but you know what I mean, that they will, we will catch each other in terms of there'll be observations, there'll be ways of thinking about it. And then we can plan about what we're going to do next. Now, ideally, and again, I'm speaking from my own personal bias here. I think there's great benefit in having a co-facilitator. So, well. yeah, I, I, I agree um, with Terrell on that because um, it is really helpful to have somebody to debrief with who was in the room with you and was part of, you know, facilitating the group with you. Um, and, you know, maybe down the road after um, I develop the group development course, maybe I'll develop a specific course um, where we really dive deeper into co-facilitation because it, 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 it can be very problematic if you're co-facilitating with somebody that you actually, and I'm going to use Terrell's word, you don't actually mesh with well because it can actually cause more problems in the group. So just, just keeping that in mind. Yeah, I'll work on that, Agnes, if I, if I, if I can. Uh, Tony writes, co-facilitation can also be needed as that safe space when someone's issues may cause someone to step away from the group um, and require one-on-one -on -one help rather than just leaving the group. Yes, absolutely. Um, do you feel there is a need to develop a curriculum for a group? Well, you know something? That's a really interesting question. Um, and and you're gonna you're not gonna be surprised by my answer, I'm sure. It depends on the purpose of the group. And what I what I would like to suggest, and I can't remember who it was who said this earlier. Um I can't remember who it was who said this, uh, because they were really sharing their process. And the thing to keep in mind is you do want to walk into group with some sort of idea about what's, what you're going to be doing or what you're going to be focusing on for that group. And what you prepare, what you may be ready for, may totally get put on the back shelf because the group has their own sort of agenda that they want to focus on at that particular time. And it's always good to have that thing based on what happened in the group before. And that's where post-group reflection as an ongoing process can be really helpful because you can jot down a few things. You can sort of reflect on, well, where are we going next in our conversation, in our work? And again, that's where having the group purpose becomes critical, folks, because if you don't have a defined purpose, it's really hard to know what your work is in the group. And the purpose could be as simple as 
The purpose of this group is to decrease isolation and give people the opportunity to come together and talk about their successes and their struggle. So it could be something as basic or clear as that. But you want to be thinking about what is the purpose. I'm going to share my screen again. So I wanted to share this, this little comparison. And the only reason I'm, I'm sharing this, and we're not going to go through this, but I wanted you to have this as part of the materials. Because I, I want to make a, a broader statement here that there is a distinction between group counseling or group work and individual counseling. And oftentimes what can happen, and there's an article, I'll speak to my colleague, uh, Tree Chapel, to see if we can send this article to everybody who's registered for this learning community conversation and who's participated in it, that there's an article that I think very uh, briefly and yet substantially addresses this issue of casework versus group work within the context of a group. Because what can happen in groups is that the leader becomes very central and very focused and is basically conducting casework within the context of the group. So we'll see if we can share that article. And the thing to note in regard to that is if that dynamic is playing out, and this article will be helpful uh, to help people to confirm whether that dynamic is playing out or not, but if that dynamic is playing out, the facilitator is actually depowering or hampering the work, the group from actually doing its work. The, the facilitator is actually interrupting the group process. So just, just keeping that in mind, and we will uh, try and make that article available to you. I mentioned earlier that having some sort of awareness of the stages of group development is helpful because it can really help provide insight and inform how we may want to facilitate. And this is Tuckman's model. These stages, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. They have other names uh, from other people, but essentially what they're looking at is, and what they're suggesting is that when groups come together, they uh, engage. Yes, you, Laura, you absolutely will get these slides. Do not worry. They will be made available to you. What these stages suggest is that when groups come together for the first time or when they reconfigure, when a bunch of new people enter an existing group, there's often what's called approach avoidance. Do I want to be there? Do I not want to be there? There's a greater ambivalence and where people are sort of attempting to get to know each other and figuring out what's the lay of the land here? What's the culture of this group? And what I can tell you is your group purpose statement and your guidelines are a big friend, especially during forming. In addition to your modeling of what the group culture and the way of interacting is. So people come together, they, they, they're in this forming stage. Do I want to be there? Do I not want to be there? And then storming is well, who's got the power here and who, and oftentimes in the storming stage of development, there are a lot of challenges to the group facilitator because they're the one seen as having the power. And what I want to underline in regard to that is that's not necessarily as uh, Addis was saying before, that's not necessarily uh resistance. It's simply part of the group trying to figure out what's our role, how do we exercise our autonomy within this frame. Norming is when we start to internalize and accept this is the purpose of the group, these are the guidelines, it's okay for me to be here, 
this is how we are going to work together. And it's okay for us to have differences. In forming and storming as a facilitator, we wanna highlight the similarities and the lengths. When people start to move into norming and performing, the group can tolerate differences. It's perfectly okay for the person to be different. We're still members of the group. Now, I noticed in the chat there was a little bit of discussion about power, and, and I do want to say this. Whether we like it or not, <laughs> when we're in the role of facilitator, we do have a kind of power that we want to exercise in a way that supports group autonomy. We do have power. We can't avoid it. The group wouldn't exist and probably wouldn't happen if it wasn't for the facilitator or for the facilitator as located within the context of the organization. So even when a group is doing its work, when a group is in the performing stage of development and they are talking to each other and doing their work, the group facilitator is still facilitating and guiding and holding the space, they may not be doing the same amount of talking. They are still facilitating and they are still exercising that guiding power. And then the last stage is adjourning. And adjourning can be very complex because people have very complex relationships to endings and goodbyes. And what I can tell you is that adjourning is a critical and very valuable stage of group process because it helps people to learn and experience, sometimes for the first time, a good ending. And that's many people who, and this is a generalization, I'm prefacing it, with a generalization based on my experience of facilitating and developing groups, I have experienced many group participants who have had very painful or traumatic endings. And for them to have a positive experience of an ending, it doesn't mean they don't feel pain. It simply means that they get to express that. They get to talk about what the group meant to them. They get to reflect on their experience in the group. And the purpose of that, folks, is consolidation and internalization. So they can consolidate their experience and they can internalize that experience and then take it away with them. And that's why adjourning is very important. And many people will say like, yeah, well, you know, the last group will have a party. Well, what I would like to suggest is facilitate adjourning. And then if you want to have a party, have a party after that. Adjourning is a critical part of helping people to use and take away with them from what they got in the group to be able to take it into their lives, further into their lives. So keeping in mind, folks, that we, it is called group work for a reason. And my, my uh, mentor, Dr. George Getzel, used to say, because it's, it's, we are directing the group to work. So in the beginning, of course, we want to establish the group agreements. We want to review the group purpose. We want to model the group interactive style. Our facilitating is to help people to connect to each other through commonalities, and we want to foster that intra-group member connection, not a dependence on us. Also, we will establish and maintain group safety to the degree that we can, and group members will do that too, and we move toward decentering ourselves, because remember, we're trying to help the group members to do the work together. And we set the stage for the group to do its work. And then we let the group do its work. We guide the group and we facilitate the group in their working together. And I wanted you to have this slide 
as kind of a bullet by bullet, step by step way of thinking, especially about the beginnings, because how you begin is going to have a huge impact on how the group goes forward. And you'll notice group agreements and group purpose are at the top of this bulleted list. So we've set the stage for the group to do its work, and then we want to help the group to dig deeper into that work. Again, we want to be doing everything that was outlined in the beginning, and we want to hold fast to the group purpose. And we want to help the group, we want to guide the group to do their work based on the purpose of the group, because sometimes the group will want to detour or, and we can keep guiding the group back to why we're together, the work we're doing together. And again, we're fostering hopefully group members working together and we can intentionally choose to avoid inserting ourselves into the group of the work, uh, into the work of the group. We can facilitate the work. We don't do the work for the group. And then this to me, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen <laughs> when I share, when I comment on this, that last bullet is probably one of the most powerful things that I take away from my group facilitation experience. And I'm going to give you a very clear example. Let's say something comes up in the group. Somebody says something. And I think in my mind, this is, I'm going to intervene in this way. And I'm just about to open my mouth and say something. And then a group member says almost exactly the same thing I was going to say. And what I want you to keep in mind, folks, is that coming from the group member has much more power than if I, as the facilitator, were to say it. And I, as a facilitator, want to make the space and support the work so that group members can actually make those statements or make those connections in place of me making them. So again, it underlines that idea that what group members will bring, and that doesn't mean there are times when I have to facilitate and that I have to make a group intervention or make a group observation or a group reflection. But one of the most, some of the most satisfying moments as, group, as a group facilitator are when I'm just about to open my mouth and something in me says, just pause for just a second. And then a group member does what I'm going to do. So just, just keeping that in mind, folks. And in the last few minutes that we have before I give you the link and give you a few minutes to fill out that evaluation, again, keeping in mind that we want to be asking the group by saying group as opposed to one particular individual. Again, we, we play that by ear. Sometimes we do reach out to a specific individual. Um, we want to keep in mind that anything that we're introducing into the group is relevant to the group and to the group purpose. We also want to be scanning the room for verbal and nonverbal reactions. We want to invite contributions, link members, and reflect group themes themes that come up for the whole group, and then guide directional discussion. And directional discussion means simply, folks, discussion that's related to the purpose of the group. And then we hopefully are building consensus. And the reason for that is because it promotes inclusion, builds trust, fosters collaboration. And again, the idea that we're continuing to dig deeper in the conversations and inviting the group to do its work, not just as individuals, but as a whole group. 
And again, the idea of fostering and reflecting a group identity. And we can use inclusive beginning and ending rituals. Okay. And again, my hope is, is that these slides will support what you're doing. Now, before I show you the very last slide, and I'm going to advance to that in just a minute, just as a way of our concluding together before we give you the link and before I show you the last slide, is I'm going to ask you to just think for a moment. If there's one thing that stands out to you about our learning community conversation today, just let that one thing rise to the top of your mind and type it into the chat. And that will be sort of our concluding ritual for me to show you the last slide and to put the link in the chat. So what is one thing that stands out to you, that comes to the top of your mind? We have empathic projection, collaboration, purpose of the group. There's no right or wrong here. It's just whatever stands out to you. Preparation, decentering my role, the importance of purpose, purpose of the group. It's okay not to know everything. The mindset and responsibility of a facilitator, collaboration. Fantastic. Again, just the one thing that rises to your mind. As you're continuing to type that in the chat, I'm going to show you the last slide. There's a QR code on there that you can scan. And my colleague, Clyde Frederick, just put the link in the chat. So please feel free. I can't thank you enough for everything that you brought to this conversation. I hope that we'll be in future learning community conversations. And again, thank you for your focus and your participation. Um, it's really been a pleasure to be with all of you here today. Thanks so much. I'm going to show you the last slide now. And Clyde will also put the uh, the active link back in the chat uh, at the at the bottom there too. There you go. So there is the QR code. And I'll just say while you're while you're getting that that the the example that I gave you of. I'm just about to open my mouth, but I pause and then the group member does it is what I mean by the greatest artists or the greatest group facilitators uh, know when not to speak and to let the group work, the group members uh, speak and do their work. So that's the connection between that phrase and group facilitation. Again, folks, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, I hope that we will You'll join me in future learning community conversations. Have a wonderful afternoon and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you.